join me in thanking all of the co-sponsors and the supporters who made this session possible. Action Aid, the East African Center for Human Rights, Education International, Education Global Access Program, Focal Point Global, GCE and GCE US, the Global Initiative for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights, the Kenya National Union of Teachers, National Education Association, Oxfam International, Results, and the Civil Society Policy Forum here at the World Bank IMF Annual Meetings. A key challenge before us is the UN Human Rights Council has urged states to regulate education providers and to invest in public education. Yet some donors are supporting fee charging for-profit private schools, which we'll refer to as low-fee private schools. This session will launch a new report from the Global Campaign for Education. Please make sure to pick up your copy at the door called Private Profit, Public Loss. Why the push for low-fee private schools is throwing quality education off track. And we'll be discussing the groundbreaking research and new uh, resources such as a video that will be featured here from Education International on the privatization of education. The new report launching today from GCE sets out the corrosive consequences of investing in low-fee private schools, inequality, social segregation, and adding to the poverty for families and children that are already struggling every day. Believe me, we would all like there to be a silver bullet solution. However, low-fee private schools are dangerously causing more problems rather than fewer. In reality, such schools worsen social inequality by creating an unfair system where the quality of a child's education is determined by how much their family can afford to pay. This report finds that low-fee private schools price families in poverty out of classrooms, stay low-fee by providing gravely low quality, put up barriers for girls' education, and fail to reach children with disabilities. This is an outrage, and we're, we're grateful you're here today to join us in looking at the evidence. The report argues that governments must stop this dangerous experiment with these for-profit private schools and instead commit to improving their public education systems. With proper funding, strong policies, and political will, governments can provide free quality education that's truly accessible to everyone. The report outlines a path for providing quality education for all children, but does warn that there really are no quick fixes. Governments should stop subsidizing private schools and instead fully fund public schools including well-trained and supported teachers and support staff, inclusive education, quality school facilities, and transparent, accountable regulation of all actors. We look forward to a really productive dialogue today between civil society, governments, donors, the World Bank Group, and all of you to support effective means to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal number four and all of the SDGs through education. As moderator, I would like to propose the following aims for our discussion today. Let's focus on the evidence of what works, keep our discussion respectful, and each lead with new information and ideas for action. The session is being audio recorded to make this information further available afterwards to interested parties that couldn't join us in person. I am now really pleased to introduce a terrific panel from around the globe. And I also ask if you would like to use your Wi-Fi or otherwise and join in on social media. This is the hashtag here, um, AMCCS16, CSO, pardon me, 16. Um, and you can see it as part of the, the Civil Society Policy Forum. Um, and we did provide as well a social media guide for those that would like to join in on Twitter. Now, I'm extremely pleased to introduce you to our first speaker. Tanvir is the International Policy Manager for Education for Action Aid. And you can see um, the complete bios that are provided for everyone. Tanvir is an expert in education, global policy architecture, aid effectiveness, development financing, and rights-based advocacy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tanvir. He will start the conversation with key points from the new GCE report launching today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. So you have seen the report. It's a big report. It will take time to read through this. So I will just take you through the key points that came from that report. So first of all, why did we do this report? And what does it uh, intend to do? 
it looks at the growth of the for-profit low-fee private schools and the actors promoting them. It examines the evidence behind the key arguments from the supporters of low-fee private schools because we wanted to look at the evidence rather than going uh, through the rhetorics or the ideological notions. It documents the impact privatization uh, of education has on poverty, inequality, and social segregation. And lastly, it offers feasible and pragmatic solutions to the challenges facing quality public education. So low fee private schools, is it about low cost and high profit? Uh, if we look at uh, some of the providers like Bridge International Academies and Omega Schools, they charge from $16 to $14 uh, per month fee. In terms of profit target, Bridge International has a profit target of $500 million over the next 10 years. And the way the global education quote unquote market is described, it's worth $4.4 trillion. And it's considered the great growth industry in the 21st century. And the profit comes not only from the fees, but it also comes from production of textbooks and the use of information communication technology, which makes the tech companies really interested in this market. So who are the big supporters of low fee private school? Uh, as we have seen, some of the bilateral donors, uh, like DFID, they are very keen on promoting low fee private school. Even though in their own countries, they are talking about public education, but when they are talking about supporting countries in Africa, they are talking about low fee private schools. Uh, we have also seen World Bank Group supporting uh, low fee private school, either through IDA, we have seen in India and Burkina Faso, and the private sector wing, IFC, it has invested uh, around $10 million in Bridge International uh, in Kenya and beyond, and it as an incentive to attract other companies stepping into the business of education. We have seen Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, and the African uh, Commission. In a recent report, they have said that Africa must build a vibrant private sector that supports the development of a dynamic primary education system. We have seen Companies like Pearson, which is the biggest uh, uh, education uh, company in the world, largest education company, investing in Africa and promoting it by, by media, like Economist, which they partly own. And we have seen philanthropic billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates promote this. So you can see that it has a wide uh, base of su support, but we need to look at the actual underlying reasons and the evidence whether it's worth supporting. So we look into five key arguments that the supporters provide for low fee private schools. First of all, that it offers better quality. These are aff affordable for all. They reach the most excluded. They are more efficient and innovative. They bring choice and competition, driving standards up and responding to parental choice. But are those true? That's what we try to uh, look in the report. There, is, there are lots of interesting case studies uh, there. But just to look at some of the key uh, findings that we have had uh, in this. So first of all, the whole notion about better quality. The definition of quality that, that is used by them is very narrow. It focuses mostly on just literacy and numeracy. And we know that this, in this current world, that's not enough if you want to become a global citizen, if you want to participate in democratic processes. They rely on test score as proxy for quality education. So it's mostly about preparing for tests than actually learning. And there is a natural bias because majority of the children who go to this school come from better off uh, families, so they can have extra tuition, extra resources invested in them. So it's not only directly related to the education provided in those schools. And we have seen unqualified and untrained teachers running these uh, schools often on short-term contracts and extremely low wages and without any opportunity to unionize or have a, a united front. And we have seen evidence of countries where the public sector is outperforming private schools in terms of learning outcomes. So in a way, we have not really seen any clear private sector advantage in terms of quality. The second argument about affordability, well, that's also questionable because <coughs> when we have seen uh, in Nigeria that sending one child would cost nearly 20% of the annual minimum wage. In Ghana, 40% of household income would be needed for poor families. And in Kenya, 
sending three children to bridge international schools would cost at least 24% of their income. So that's not cheap by any means. Secondly, these uh, poor communities are already contributing, often at higher rate because of regressive taxation systems. They are paying taxes, and so paying fees is essentially double charging them. And we have seen the success of countries that have removed fees, which are uh, like Uganda, where enrollment rose by 73% when the user fees were moved. So do we really want to go back to the era of charging schools? Wouldn't that be regressive? And so available evidence actually contradicts the assertion that these schools are affor affordable for all. So what's happening, as Jennifer mentioned, they're effectively pricing the poor communities out of education. The next argument that we hear is whether that they're quite efficient and innovative. But what we have seen that they're very unsustainable and they're subject to frequent closures. You see these schools springing up like mushroom in some places after a few months they close and so it affects performance and efficiency without having the children to go to school. There is very low cost standardization of education there and technology is considered a replacement rather than a supplement to qualified teachers. So the assumption is that you give a tablet and scripted lessons and children will be able to learn without considering the need for interactive education. And the whole pay-as-you-go schemes comes at the expense of quality. So we have seen children becoming child laborer for a day, earn the money, and then go back to school the next day. That's not the type of uh, efficiency and innovation that we are looking for. And so the lack of evidence in efficiency and dubious innovations are based on uh, outdated education principles, so that argument really doesn't hold up. Then we have seen the whole argument that they reach the unreached. Again, it's questionable because most of the schools that we have seen are in urban areas, whereas most out-of-school children are in rural areas, so they don't really reach them. And girls likely to be out of school because of the fees, because when you have to pay fees, parents prefer to send boys to school, so it becomes exclusionary. And we have seen cases when these schools select children who are likely to better in tests. For example, they do not allow children with disabilities to be admitted in school, again, promoting exclusion. And they are generally not enrolling out of school children, rather they are getting children from the nearby government school, so basically tapping into the children who are already going to school. And one of the urgent need is for a conflict and fragile context. We have seen very little evidence and presence of these schools there. So there is clear lack of evidence in reaching the unreached. And the last argument that we hear that they promote choice and competition. But what we have seen that when the parents become dissatisfied, they are likely to stay. They start bargaining about uh, bringing the fee down and then they do fee jumping, move from one school to another. So it does not become a an exercise of good choices. And these choices are also based on inaccurate information. They look at uh, private schools in city area where lots of uh, investment are being made and they assume that is the same type of education that they will get in these low fee private schools, which is not true at all. And the countries where the private sector is responsible for a greater proportion of school provision fail to outperform systems with less private involvement. So there is, again, no evidence that it works. And parents enroll children in private schools against their true preference due to a lack of alternatives. So if they had public schools present in those areas, it would not have been a uh, case. So this concept of choice is deeply flawed, and the poorest families suffer the most serious constraints. So where do we go from here? The finding supports the whole conclusion that we need to have public first, because that's the surest way to quality education. We need to increase the confidence in public education. We need to increase the financing of public education, as we have seen that it has been gradually going down. And so that has affected the quality. We need to make education spending progressive and increasing the scrutiny of how that money allocated is being used. And we have to find uh, ways of mobilizing more resources. And that's why we call, call on the whole tax justice for domestic resource mobilization, which can also help mobilize more resources for public education. We need to uh, see the increase in quality and equity in the public sector. 
and we need to ensure there is public regulation of the private education providers. And we have seen recent cases, and our colleagues will talk about the situation in uh, Uganda and Kenya, how, how this is working out. So I look forward to further conversation and how we can take this issue forward together in a collaborative manner. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I'd like to properly introduce, um, and so that we can hear from the latest on the ground, Wilson Socian is the Secretary General of the Kenya National Union of Teachers and President of the African Regional Committee of Education International. We are pleased that Socian can today beam in to share his perspective. Socian, Kenya has the largest presence of the for-profit low-fee private school chain Bridge International Academy. Given Education International's campaign in Kenya, what has the response been from the general public on this? What's been happening on the ground? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. First, before I give the current status, one is that uh, the Article 43 of the Constitution of Kenya recognizes basic education as a human right in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 53 of the Constitution is very explicit that every child has a right to free and compulsory education. And uh, there are many government initiatives uh, in this country to ensure that this is achieved basically through free primary education and affordable secondary education. However, there are close to 2 million children who are still out of school, majority from poor households, in urban slums and marginalized parts of this country. And uh, the private sector has played a key role in Kenya since independence. But of late, we have witnessed the upsurge of the now known low cost fee for profit private schools. And in Kenya, Bridge International is the most notorious that is purportedly trying to use the recently uh, approved uh, added regulations. I, I think the latest in this country is that the ministry has approved uh, added regulation to regulate non-formal schools. And uh, Bridge is trying to hide behind the ABED regulation while offering a curriculum that even does not meet the legislative framework of, of this country. Brick schools are ill-equipped and do not meet the education standards of this country. This has been confirmed by the ministry through a quality assurance report. Uh, Brick schools continue to charge $8 for fees per child and ten dollars for lunches and also for uniform per child per month which is above the minimum uh which is above the earnings of the, the slum dwellers the schools do still to date do not meet infra infrastructural education standards of uh, kenyan education bridge have tried to expand all over the country in fact in all the 47 countries in a very business and suspicious like manner. The schools do not follow the national curriculum and up to date they do not employ or utilize uh, services of qualified teachers. So by any standards, Bridge is still operating outside the, the regulation, the constitution and the laws of this country. And therefore as a union, there are a number of observations that we still hold that one bridge is contravening the education regulations as stipulated in the Education Act, the Teacher Service Commission Act, and also the Constitution. And number two, the curriculum is illegal. The curriculum being delivered is foreign. It is illegal. It is not yet approved by Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, and therefore it is discriminatory to the Kenyan children. Number three, the churches are a manifestation of exploitation of the already poor in the society, yet education should be free in this country. Uh, bridge, uh, for bridge intervention encourages the government to abdicate our cardinal responsibility in the provision of education for all. We do not need bridge in the slum. We do not need bridge 
in the marginal areas. We need government to move in to fund uh, uh, the public education in these particular areas. We are also seriously concerned with the fact that the World Bank, the DFID, have continued to support uh, Bridge International instead of supporting public schools. $10 million is a lot of money for public schools within the slum areas. And we believe the World Bank should have supported the public education system around the slum areas and in the marginal area so that we can achieve equity and quality in public schools. Uh, we are still driving the campaign. We have cascaded our campaigns of sensitization of country education boards, our leadership, the, uh, the legislature, and uh, to the counties and to the various institutions. And we still believe as Kenyans that the low cost for profit schools is the wrong direction for Kenya to take. All schools must comply, any school operating in Kenya must comply with the regulation, ensuring that all children are taught by qualified teachers, delivering a curriculum consistent with the national standards in facilities that meet minimum requirements, and schools that don't comply must have their licenses revoked. We have written to Parliament, we have written to the Minister for Education to relook at the matter of breach and to act on the report that has been generated by the Quality Assurance Report and close down uh, bridge schools that are not authorized. The number of schools is about 175, and most of them are not even mm. registered. Uh, Kenyans ask for the public education system to be expanded to include pupils from bridge academies. Uh, as we move towards December and in the new year, we would expect the ministry to reorganize itself and reorganize the public schools around slum areas and in marginalized areas to receive students from bridge schools. We will be intensifying our campaign towards end of October once we, we receive a, a comprehensive research study that is being undertaken on Kenya. Otherwise, as unions, as civil societies, our position remains very strong, and we are in agreement with the reports of the ministry, the reports of other arms of government, that Bridge International is the wrong group to invest and commoditize education in Kenya. We still believe the government of Kenya can provide quality public education to children in slum areas and in marginal areas. Thank you very much, Sosian. It's, it's extremely important to have the chance to hear from you, and we'll um, be discussing these important points after the presentations. No, thank you. And now we have the honor of hearing from Salima, the Executive Director of the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights in Uganda. Salima, thank you for, very, very much for joining us. Extremely late in your day. Uganda has been under the global spotlight as the government of Uganda has recently demanded bridge to cease operations in the country. What has the response been from the general public on this? What's been happening on the ground and in your experience? And Salima, if you would, um, we have lots of colleagues in the room here who are seeing the slides. If you just let me know when you would like us to proceed to the next slide, we'll move it along for you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Jennifer. It's a bit difficult to address an audience that you do not speak, but um, I'll try my best, hoping that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Can, I, can people in the back hear? Yeah. Wonderful. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, I'll talk about this uh, small background about the law generally in Uganda. Their growth has been driven by a legal and policy environment that allowed for legalization of the education sector. Uh, the public has been supportive to an extent that for a long time private actors were not paying any taxes. But of course, there is the other factor of the weaknesses in the public education system that has um, allowed 
for the growth of lofty private schools. Now, these um, lofty schools are the less poor and are operated mostly by businessmen, largely for profit. And some operate under public-private partnerships using public funds. Um, many of the lofty private schools are urban-based, and they are in places uh, in mostly slum areas in the urban areas in, um, in many of the districts in Uganda. Now, the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights um, conducted research in 2014-2015 that showed that the existence of these schools has had a negative impact on education of the poor and, and vulnerable groups in various ways. Uh, one of them was the reintroduction of these that were abolished when we got the universal primary um, education and universal secondary education. With uh, the growth of the private schools, the issue of fees is coming back and it's having a detrimental impact on the education of especially poor children. Then also we've seen a trend of relaxation by the government, for example, through declining investment in the public education sector. Currently, we have only 4% of the gross domestic product going towards the education sector. And this has had uh, negative consequences on the uh, public education system. But also, we found that the low fee, the quality of education and value for money in the low fee in private schools is often lacking. Um, and this really is against uh, the, is one of the strongest points that the, the supporters of these schools put forward, which is an issue of quality, um, a, a, a promoting quality in schools, but it's been found that this is actually not true. And then uh, these schools are also not helping out-of-school children, including, for example, children from poor areas and vulnerable groups like children with disabilities because they do not have policies for example, for reasonable accommodation for children with disabilities. But also, most of them have to remain in urban areas where there are some people who can, um, who can pay for, for their services. And also, what uh, is happening is that they are creating unhealthy competition with the public sector. Their enrollment taps into children who have been in the public sector, and many times the children, uh, the, the parents that are able to uh, promote accountability in the public schools are exiting and going into the private sector. Now, British International Academy joined the sector in 2015. Um, the company came to Uganda and established its first schools in 2016, and their characteristics are similar to those of other low schools that um, I've already uh, you talked about um, uh, before the, the fact that um, you know the, the, the reintroduction of fees and all the issues that I've raised about. But with regard to bridge, there is more that has to be drawn um, that draws attention to them aside from the fact that they operate just like any other low fee private school. First of all, is um, the fact that they are an international player. And they are financed um, internationally, including by the likes of um, uh, the, the IFC and, and DFID. But secondly, the scale of their operation is also something that um, is very significant. Currently, they have 63 schools in Uganda, but this is way below their target because um, they are currently facing challenges with a government regarding the legality of their operations in Uganda, as well as the fact that the government feels that they are operating below the required um, minimum standards for operating a school in Uganda. Now, um, there have been several developments regarding the Bridge International Academy here in Uganda. First of all, we saw that in January 2016, um, the BIA management was invited by um, the education, basic, the basic Education Working Group of the Ministry of Education, Sports and Technology, and the Ministry raised various concerns after interacting initially with Bridge 
And um, the concerns included things like the fact that Greed was running an unlicensed teacher training institution where they take um, people that they've recruited to work as teachers in their schools and they are trained for a few weeks then they go back to teach in, in the various academies around the country. But there's also the issue of uh, use of unregistered teachers, which is contrary to the law in Uganda, because the Education Act requires that, um, that the teachers who are teaching in schools are registered by the Ministry of Education, and it was found that largely um, the teachers in British schools are not registered. Then there was the, the issue of poor infrastructure, um, also uh, issues of poor sanitation in the, in the grid schools, and then the fact that grid is operating with an, 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 an unapproved curriculum. Um, the, the ministry, even as of Tuesday, they were still saying the curriculum being used by Bridge International is not uh, approved by the ministry. Then um, in April, so um, in April 2016, the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Education, Sports and Technology wrote to uh, Bridge International Academy directing them not to open any new schools until the concerns raised had been addressed. Um, so at that point, they, they remained with the schools. That's why they are still at 63, much as um, their target was much more than 63. Then um, later in July, uh, the Ministry of Education issued a letter directing uh, the closure of Bridge International Academy. Now this letter came because there were still complaints coming up from various districts around the country because uh, our system largely operates in a decentralized manner. So there are many districts where Bridge was operating and still there were complaints about the, the standards of the Bridge Academies in those districts. And um, since the Ministry had already talked about, uh, it had already engaged with Bridge and told them to uh, rectify the concerns that they had, they issued a letter for closure. Now, um, when they received that letter, Bridge International Academies to go to court, and they were seeking um, an order, a, a judicial review order in stopping the, the implementation of the order of uh, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Education. But then shortly afterwards, we had also the Minister of Education herself, who also happened to be a first lady, announcing on the floor of parliament in Uganda that they had taken the decision to, to close all Bridge International Academies in the country. And she said that this followed a technical report by officials of the Ministry of Education visiting various Bridge International Academies and finding them to be operating below minimum standards, but also um, they were operating without licenses in the country. So they took the decision to, 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 to close all Bridge schools. But the court case was there already, and Bridge went and secured an interim order against the closure of, of, of their school until the case is had. But um, only yesterday, uh, no, not yesterday, on Tuesday, we had the national newspaper, the News Vision here in Uganda, the government newspaper, giving us some highlights of the government response and um, bringing excerpts of uh, what the permanent secretary told the court about the Bridge International Academy. And in short, she was maintaining the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the fact that, uh, in their opinion, Bridge International Academy are substandard and that um, the government has communicated this over time and that they still stand by their decision that they should not be operating and that um, it is not true what Bridge is arguing that um, they, they were not given a fair hearing before the order for closure was made. So what's obtaining at the moment is that we are all waiting to hear what the final outcome of the, uh, of the case will be after hearing of the merits of the case, because at the moment, they, the court hasn't yet had the arguments on both sides. So we are still waiting to see what, will, uh, become, what judgment will come out. But also, um, in some of the districts, the Bridge International Academies remain closed because those districts are maintaining 
that they should not be given preferential treatment, yet they are still operating below minimum standards, and the orders to close them were given way before uh, the court issues came up. Yeah, I guess that is what I can share. Some of the issues will come up um, during that question time. Thank you so much, Salima, and thank you for leading the charge and for taking the time to give us this real-time update. We're very grateful. And now, um, I would like to introduce Oni Lusk-Stover, the team leader for the World Bank's systems approach for better education results, engaging the private sector program. Um, and please do look at her complete bio, and uh, we're grateful, Oni, that you um, were able to join us for this important session today. Oni comes from a family of public school teachers um, and has joined us specifically to respond to the report, um, the discussions that we've been having, and to share an example from Senegal as well. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Jennifer and the organizing team across organizations for making today possible. Um, thanks to all of you. I know it's always hard to have a session after lunch, um, especially on an overcast day. Uh, so thank you for your attention and being here. Um, I always like to start this session just with a, a bit of interaction, especially after a few presentations and it's also timely given the topic. Um, and what that interaction or audience interaction is, um, is to just have a, a quick show of hands for the different types of schools that all of us attended during our education. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a range of different provider types um, from community-run schools or schools run by faith-based organizations. Okay. You're having trouble hearing me? <laughs> okay. Now I should be heard. Um, luckily, I speak very slowly, as my mother always tells me, so <laughs> you should have no problem understanding me now that the mic is correct. Um, so I'll, as I was saying, I'll be talking about a number of different school types, from schools run by community organizations, faith-based organizations, um, as well as what we consider independent private schools, um, but really a wide range because within the work that I do and that my team does, they're here with me today, um, we take an inclusive definition of engaging the private sector and what the private sector means. For us, we also term it non-state um, because oftentimes when we have discussions, the terminology really matters. Um, and so very quickly, if you could just raise your hand if, if you attended private school, or let's start with public. If you attended public school at some point during your education experience. Great. Um, now a show of hands if you attended a community-run or faith-based school of some sort. So that could be Catholic school, that could be any number of community or faith-based run schools. Great. Um, and finally, a, a quick show of hands if at some point during your educational experience you attended a private school. Including university. Including university. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, including university. Okay, great. Thank you for participating. Um, I like to do that because I also attended a range of different provider types. I went to a public primary school a Catholic middle school here in the United States, and then a private high school. Um, and why did I go to that range of providers? Because my parents wanted the best educational experience for me, even though they themselves were public school teachers and deeply committed to being public school teachers. And from the show of hands, it seems like many of us in this room have also experienced a range of different education providers. So I want to delve right in, um, and that will form the basis of this ongoing discussion. So first and foremost, just a little background on 
the World Bank and education. Um, our education sector strategy for the current period, the title is Learning for All. And that is very purposeful. And the, the motto of this strategy is invest early, invest smartly, invest for all. And that's fairly self-explanatory um, and a really important motto to keep in mind. Um, you can read the statistics here on the slide that are in front of you, um, but they really speak to the challenge that all of us are uh, trying to address throughout our work, which is that some 121 million children are still out of primary and lower secondary school, and 250 million children cannot read or write, although they may have been to school. This is the challenge. We all know this to be the challenge. And so how, how do we address this challenge? Within the World Bank group, we define an education system as all learning opportunities that are available in a society. We believe that every child has a right to a free quality public education. And as the world's largest external development financer for education, we continue to be deeply committed to working with governments to strengthen their leadership in the education sector and to deliver equitable services through their public education systems. The vast majority of our funding, over 90% for education, goes to the public sector toward our stated goal of learning for all. I lead a research initiative at the World Bank titled Systems Approach for Better Education Results, Engaging the Private Sector. Uh, the SABER initiative is a flagship research initiative within the World Bank um, that was funded in part by this gentleman sitting in the, the front row. Um, and what it aims to do is, is take a systems approach to advance the global evidence base about policies in a range of sectors or a range of subsectors within education, from teacher policies to early childhood development to engaging the private sector. And what are we doing exactly? And I, these are really my key takeaway message and something that Jennifer mentioned at the beginning. Our aim is to increase the global evidence base on engaging the private sector, not to promote privatization. That is not our aim whatsoever. Our aim is to help governments gain a better understanding of education markets, specifically their education markets, and how to more effectively increase accountability, not just from the government to the non-state sector, but from parents to the non-state sector to be able to also hold governments accountable. So we're really advocating for increasing accountability amongst all actors within the education system and to build the evidence base behind what is happening in education markets, but then how, how we can effectively increase accountability and transparency within those markets. So in order to achieve this aim, we have three areas or three levels of analysis. We have what we call policy intent, which falls under SEBEAR, because SEBEAR is a policy intent initiative. It looks at laws and policies as they pertain to the education system. So for us, that's looking at laws and policies within education systems as they pertain to the non-state sector. The second level of analysis is what we call policy implementation and dialogue. So are those laws and policies actually being implemented? And what is the degree of dialogue between the various actors within an education system? So what is the degree of dialogue between private school associations 
and the government, between parents and communities and the government, and so forth. And we've developed tools to be able to measure that. And then finally, what we call our in-depth studies, which is implementing school-level surveys to ask a set of questions and continue to challenge our own assumptions. And we've carried out this work on the in-depth level, now in Ghana, which was our pilot country, in Lagos, Nigeria, in Tanzania, and we'll be carrying out this work in the coming year in Senegal, which will be my country example that I'll offer in a few minutes, and also launching work in Somalia, as well as the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And you can see here, these are the countries that we have engaged in through this work program. And once again, the emphasis is on increasing the evidence base so that we know what the markets look like when it comes to issues of access, quality, equity, and affordability. I mentioned this when we did our raise of hands. So we take an inclusive approach to what we define as the private sector or the non-state sector. It is a range of different providers, not only bridge academies, for instance, as we've heard about in both Kenya and Uganda, but also BRAC schools in Bangladesh, as an example, or the Fei Alegria schools in Latin America, or the Educo schools in El Salvador. Within our work program, we also, besides these provider types, we have, in order to carry out our analysis, what we call our policy goals. And these include holding schools accountable. They also include empowering all parents, students, and communities. We have four policy goals, which are based on the international evidence, but also emerging evidence on what works to strengthen accountability and transparency in order to have a regulatory framework that addresses and furthers the issues of increasing access, promoting quality, addressing equity, and really unpacking what affordable means. Getting to the country example. Within this space, we often hear quite a bit about Kenya, Uganda, which is important. We should continue to talk about these countries. India as well, which was mentioned earlier. Pakistan, Burkina Faso was mentioned. But part of our work aims to expand the discussion, expand what we know, the countries that we're talking about, because there's a lot more countries that are grappling with these issues and engaging in different ways with how to best meet the goal of learning for all. So I'm going to offer the example of Senegal. The Senegalese government approached us and said, we have education goals and priorities, but we're at a place where we need to to reevaluate re how we regulate the non-state sector. We're in the process of revising a law from the 1990s, and we need to gain an understanding of, a better understanding of our laws and policies overall, but then also what other countries are doing. And so we embarked on the benchmarking exercise, the policy intent exercise for Senegal. And during this process, it was a, a very, a process that started with a stakeholder workshop in, in Senegal that was chaired by the Ministry of Education and involved CSO groups, involved private providers, involved representatives from parent groups, because in the work that we're doing to advance the global evidence base and further the discussion, we take a very participatory approach but we want, first and foremost, the government to lead this discussion and dialogue and approach. So we had the workshop, we launched the work, then we carried out the process, and then we went back and had another stakeholders workshop in March of 2015 that was chaired by the Minister of Education. 
which led to the discussion of these policy options. And if you take just a, a minute or two to read them, you'll notice something. So I'll, I'll let you read them quickly. Don't worry, there won't be a test. <laughs> so if you look at these, you may notice that these are not specific to the non-state sector. These policy options further a policy dialogue that if implemented, school inspections, providing parents with information, ensuring that resources are used to improve the quality of education, this strengthens an education system overall, and that's really what we're promoting. That these policy options, inspections, information to parents, this raises the bar on the entire system, not just non-state providers. And that's what's really key to this work. So where do we go from here? We met with the Minister of Senegal last week when he was here in DC. And we will be carrying out provider level survey work in Senegal in November. And there will be a number of components to this work. We've agreed on research questions with the ministry. We spent all of the spring and part of the summer going back and forth and having workshops with the Ministry of Education before presenting to the minister. So we've agreed with the ministry on what our research questions will be for this provider level survey work. We've also come up with a country engagement piece because for this work, we really want to make sure that the communities we engage with understand exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that we unpack our own assumptions about what they would want to know. We also will be implementing two surveys, our provider level survey for engaging the private sector, but we're also adding stallings to our existing provider level survey to really get at the quality of instruction and the type of interactions happening in the classroom. And we're able to do this because we're building on the existing evidence and we're taking stock of what the global discussion is and how it's evolving and what is possible. And we realize that the bar is high, and it should be, but in order to advance the evidence, in order to have more examples, in order to really understand why parents are making these choices and how governments and parents and communities can make more informed choices and have more options, we really need to unpack not only our assumptions, but the assumptions of, of everyone who participates in these discussions. Um, and I would uh, encourage you to look on our website, um, of course, because we have the full Senegal report um, available, as well as the, the theoretical framework and the evidence base behind the work that we're doing. And I look forward to, to your questions and continuing this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and to help us kick off this discussion, Tanvir will um, give us a, an immediate response. And Tanvir, what actions can the advocates and civil society organizations take as a result of the, the evidence highlighted in the new Global Campaign for Education report being launched today? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I mean, in the report, we have got specific recommendations targeting uh, governments, donors, and civil society. So if we pick the case of civil society in this case, there are specific actions that can, they can take based on the evidence found in this report and the arguments that came up. I mean, firstly, it's about strength, strengthening the positive vision of public education, because what we have seen that the whole notion or the perception of private sector efficiency, which has been questioned and disproved many times, it's still prevalent. So in a way, it's about looking at the evidence and seeing that the, the value of public education and it needs to be reinforced as part of the narrative. 
Secondly, it's about the civil society becoming actively engaged in policy processes, not being passive, but actively engaging and influencing it according to what is needed by the children, by the community. Thirdly, it's about direct participation in the education governance processes, starting from the school level up to the national policy and program implementation level. Fourthly, it's about being engaged in research on the, these private provisions and whether they are actually fulfilling the needs or whether they are actually in line with the human rights obligation by the government. And finally, to contribute to setting national standards for providers and having actual safeguard and redress mechanisms which can ensure that the right to education is not violated in the for-profit for private schools. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and so we really want to hear from all of you. Um, we also want to recognize that you've been sitting for a while. So um, you get a bonus of uh, asking a question here to please come on up. We have two microphones. Um, and we please don't be shy. We would encourage everybody to, uh, to ask a question, a comment. And um, we wonderfully have all of our panelists and speakers, including those that are beaming in, uh, if you have a specific question that you'd like to address to a certain person or just one more generally. Great. Hello. Please introduce yourself. Great. Thank you. I'm Tom Savella, and I'm an independent consultant in education. My question, having not read the report, but I say, you say that um, these private schools are taking children, in many cases, out of already public schools, so they're not providing education for children who are not in school. So I guess my question is, what are they, how, what are they doing? Why are parents choosing to pay to go to these schools? What is it? My only theory is that are that they're building schools closer to the children. Children previously were going long distances to get to the closest available public school, and they're building these private schools in slum areas where there isn't a nearby public school. Or what? I guess what do these private schools have on their side? Maybe a few more questions. Yep. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes. Hi. Um, are they still on the people? Kenya. Yes. Yes. Um, so my, this question is for them. Um, they they know that those places Kibera slum because I, I schooled in Kenya. Um, Do you mind just introducing yourself? Sorry, my Thank name you. Is Oluwa my organization is Think Tank in Focus, and um, I'm very inter interested in human capital development. So that's why I'm here. Um, they know that these areas are slum areas. And so the reason why most people even just put your children, because that's, that's actually the issue. They just put their children in school so that they say the children are in school without, you know, a standard. And that's, that's the function of governance or good or bad governance. So in this case, before, before we get good governance, people have to go to school. What are the alternatives? Because there's no funding. Which government is going to fund all Buhari, the president of my country, he says he's going to fund um, students, give them food. He made that promise once he got into power, but he hasn't been able to fulfill it because even at the moment, Nigeria is in a recession. So um, what, what are the, because they're on the ground, so they know what is going on. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the solutions that can come out of this meeting and that they will be able to use after they've left this meeting? You know, you, and also, please, um, Voice the World Bank ladies here. Voice your opinion about what you think you need, so that you can get solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shannon Ronis, and I'm from the Education Global Access Program. We are one of the co-sponsors of this event, and it's been great. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, my question is kind of long. Um, sorry, right now. <laughs> So during the discussion on Bridge International, there was a lot of focus on certification and being in compliance with national standards. So our organization offers teacher training, and having done work in Kenya, we can say from experience that the route to accreditation is very closed off, and it's very expensive, and it's highly politicized, and it doesn't necessarily lead to a higher quality education in our experience. So we still see that the teacher colleges are teaching rote memorization tactics which we know is empirically less effective than more student-centered outcomes. So my question is, how do we make sure that certifications and the politics around them don't strangle the quality of education? Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm Jill Christensen from the National Education Association doing international work here as well as in with education unions around the world. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to get the Global Campaign for Education report. And really, I think, coming back to these core questions of there are many provisions of education. Government has a sole responsibility to provide. As, as in fact, there are contracts being given. Liberia has not been mentioned yet, and you said, okay, we need to diversify. Liberia, which sought to and still seeks to privatize, contract out all of their primary education services, schools, by 2020. And specifically, it was a sole contract initially delivered to Bridge International Academies. After that, they backtracked a little bit and divided elsewhere. My question is really directed for ONI, and the question has to do with for-profit. These are for-profit entities, and I certainly know the bank has been down the road for many years about PPPs. For-profit, taking from, in fact, what would have been meager government sources. In the case of Liberia, of course, it's a mighty, mighty big grant from the World Bank. So the government of Liberia doesn't initially need to put in their own resources. For profit, which pockets are being lined? Do the resources even stay within the country? So I have real questions and challenges with that, and I'd like to understand, again, the continuing use of the term education markets, rather than education services for the public good. Thanks. My name is Nitin Garth. I'm from a World Bank of your question. I just want to have a question on uh, the evidence on the low fee you know, private school. I was looking at the uh, study by the World Bank, and it says the um, same number of uh, schools are opened by the government uh, sector in India and by the private sector. However, there is um, enrollment gone down by 6.7 million students in India. And on the private sector, this increased by 35 million students in the private sector. So how this study is fit into example of India? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Fantastic questions. Let's pause there. Um, I think there's definitely more than enough fodder for all of our panelists, and we'll help make sure that um, Sosiana and Salima can, can join in. What I might do is first to ask um, Oni and then Tanvir the pieces that um, please do respond to as many things as, as you can. I'm really grateful to all of you for sharing your passion with us today and, and really raising these important concerns. And all you need to do is press the button. The big, yeah, that should do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Um, and I will try to get to as many pieces as possible. Um, and if I don't, you can always talk to me after. Um, I'm happy to have any discussions. Um, I'm glad that you raised Liberia. Um, it's gotten a lot of press um, in the last year, um, and it is very much on the radar of all in this space. Um, I think it, it's phenomenal that there's been a bit of stepping back, um, and now that um, there will be a impact evaluation and a pilot program that will go forward. Um, and I'm sure you're aware of that, that it will be 90 schools um, with a number of different providers, including BRAC and others, um, that will participate in this pilot um, that will be rigorously evaluated. Um, and so I think that really shows that, that we're all human, first of all, um, and that secondly, when it comes to this, we do need to step back and really think about going forward in a way that makes sense. Um, and some of you who may not be as familiar with what's happening in Liberia, which is also very understandable, um, there's actually a, a great blog post from Justin Sandifor um, at the Center for Global Development, who will actually be the lead investigator um, for this work in Liberia um, and included within this blog post um, is a link to a very detailed FAQ on exactly what the pilot 
and the impact evaluation will look like. Um, and I think Liberia is a great case of we need to, to have the evidence before we move forward. Um, and now that's happening. Um, to, uh, to address some of your other questions, I heard you on education markets versus education services. Um, I think first and foremost, we need to think about this as children going to school um, and make it personal because education will always be personal. Um, and so I am not an economist, I'm an education specialist. Um, and in my approach to this work program and in my time at the World Bank over the past 10 years, and because I come from a family of teachers, I always relate it back to we are talking about people's lives and we're talking about choices and trade-offs that families and communities have to make in order to send children to school. Um, I also happen to be the, the gender focal point for the education global practice at the bank. Um, so I think about it not only wearing the hat of, of my engaging in private sector work, but also absolutely from the equity and gender lens as well. Um, so I very much hear your point on the provision of education services. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, always recognizing that a government should be the steward of the education system um, and oversee any services that are provided within that system. Um, I don't want to take away too much from others responding, um, so I'll just focus on those two comments, but um, if you want to talk after, I'm happy to continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, I'll just cluster some of the questions for ease of response. So I think one question was around what is attracting children away from private to public schools? And I, I'd link that with the question raised in the context of India, where enrollment in private school has gone up in co comparison with the government schools. I mean, again, I think I, when I presented, I mentioned the whole notion, the perception that goes around the, of private sector's mythical efficiency, that it's much more efficient than others. That's one of the reasons uh, children are uh, sort of brought to the private sector. But there are other reasons. For example, when you see a school using tablets in its education, never mind how it's being used, and the fascination that people have with technology, that convinces people, OK, they're using technology. They must be better. OK, let's take them there. In countries like India, I mean, I come from Bangladesh, part of the subcontinent, we have the fascination with the language of English. So whenever we say private school, we mean English medium schools. And if you're learning English, definitely the content will be better. That's a perception. And that's what the private schools also capitalize in that part of the world. The other thing that happens, um, is that the way the whole uh, public school system has been losing its investment. If we look at the global commitments, we are talking about 6% of GDP or 15% or 20% of budget going to education. But if we look at countries like this, including India, we would see that the investment hovers around 2 to 4% of GDP with huge number of out of school children. So if we took the, take the case of India, it has one of the largest number of out of school children, uh, illiterate adults in the world. So in a way, I think Noam Chomsky explained it very well. If you want to privatize something, you defund it, people get dissatisfied, and they start supporting private schools. So it's about putting our money where our mouth is, where our commitments are, which we have failed to do so far. And the question that I always say, that when people uh, ask me that, why should we send our children to a public school when there is good quality private school? I said the right question is, if we have equally good quality public and private schools existing with enough investment, would we still send our children to private school? And invariably, the answer that I receive is that no. In that case, we will send our children to public school. Um, uh, in terms of uh, Liberia is a very interesting example. I think all of us have been grappling with the notion. And it has been really interesting to see the government saying that they don't have money to pay for public education and then cough up up to, from 11 million to up to more than 50 million dollars 
investing in the pilot and in giving for profit providers so it actually raises the question where is the intention where is the intention lies in terms of supporting public school and we know that the evaluation is going to happen which is all very well but we see this extra investment in the pilot schools and not any extra investment in the public schools so that evaluation is not going to turn out to be very fair it's not very uh, hard to anticipate that um, so I'll stop there. I think our colleagues will, uh, will respond to those questions specific to Kenya and Uganda, especially mm -hmm. certification and others. Okay. Thank you. I want to make sure we get Shannon's good question on teacher training and certification covered as well. Um, so, Sian, were you able to hear the questions? We, w uh, we have several people who would like to, uh, and Salima, I know that you're um, joining us, uh, so I want to just quickly um, give some highlights. Um, one question, why are parents se sending their children to low fee public schools. Tanpir addressed that some, which is great, but also what are the alternatives? What are the actual solutions as you think about um, specific options uh, before you today? And um, your comments on teacher training and certification uh, would be very helpful as well to, to help move beyond rote memorization and, and techniques that are not as effective. So Sian, would you like to go first? Let's hope that we can all hear. Oh, just one moment, please. Sorry, let me, uh, can you try that again? Uh, hello, are you getting For calls to the United States and Canada, hello? please dial yes. one before the year code. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, why parents ought to take mm -hmm. children from public to private? Um, the rich international schools are purporting to offer better quality education through its marketing strategies using billboards and promising parents that they will give every child a laptop uh, in Kenya. Th these are the marketing strategies that uh, they are using and generally since the introduction of free primary education, the large classes in public schools has affected the delivery of quality education. So uh, some parents feel their children can get better education in a private school that is affordable. So this, 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 these are deceptive opportunities that have been presented and which Bridge is trying to take full advantage of. But uh, uh, we, we think this, this is not the correct position. If anything, Bridge is not offering the alternative quality education. Number two, uh, the ground solutions in specific areas like the slums. Uh, in Kibera, for example, the largest slum in the continent of Africa, 95% of the schools are private, 5% are public. That tells us that there is low investment in public education in the slums by the government. This is a fact that is not told. This is a fact that is not addressed and therefore the children in these slums remain condemned. We don't think uh, parents would refuse to take their children to public schools if such schools were availed. And uh, we are happy the minister has been able to visit and see the bridge schools that are worse than the slums themselves in terms of infrastructure. And, and there is clear commitment to reorganize and have public schools operate in this particular area. Once that the good programs, which the ministry seems to be committed to rearrange and reorganize and take the children to public schools and establish more public schools, then we will be giving the children in the slums equal opportunities like the rest in other public schools. The teacher training, of course, is the same case scenario as in Uganda, that uh, bridge are utilizing school.
school to operate within this country. Thank you very much. Salima, I hope you've been able to hear some of this. In particular, um, we have questions around um, in your context, why do you see parents sending children to low-fee public school, private schools? Um, what are the alternatives and what are the solutions that could be applicable for everyone here? And uh, you have about 50 people in the room who've expressed passionate concerns and questions on, on these topics. Let me, just one moment. Ah. Okay, um, one of the questions um, in particular is why in your context are parents choosing to send their children to, to low-fee private schools? What are the alternatives? What are the solutions? Yes. And thank you all for bearing with us okay. with the technology. If it's not working for the sake of time, we can we can keep moving. But please go ahead if, if there's anything you'd like to say. You have the microphone. Sorry. I think it's I think it's just hard to pick up. Okay. No problem. It's okay. Thank you so much. Just one moment. Um, and, and Salima's work is, is fantastic, as I'm, I'm sure you, you can all tell, um, with apologies for the, uh, the technology. It sometimes is very difficult. To, World Bank has amazing technology, but unfortunately, these rooms are locked down from, from allowing us to maximize it. But what I'd like to do is, <laughs> is just um, <laughs> also highlight for all of you a few resources that I think can help us as we're, we're grappling with next steps here. Um, I hope that, that you have found that the new resources, the information, and this discussion is helpful. Um, clearly this is the, the beginning, not the, um, and there's much for all of us to do. Um, we want you to leave with ideas for action. Um, in particular, I'd like to raise to your attention a few things. Our colleagues at Education International have a campaign um, on privatization that every, everyone can join. Um, that's an online resource and that's a, a growing movement that um, those of you from across civil society might find of interest. And then we really hope that you read the whole GCE report, but in case you um, have time just for the, the 10 point briefer, please make sure you get that as well. Um, this 10 point briefing um, on the new report provides next steps and a call to action from today's report launch. And in particular, what I'd like to highlight is um, on the back, um, some ideas and su recommendations for governments, for donors, for us as civil society as well. And you can find those complete recommendations beginning on page 43 in, in the full report. Um, is there anything um, that um, Tanvir and Oni you'd like to uh, briefly close with in, in our last moment, moment together? I just wanted to once again thank all of the participants today, thank the organizers, um, and congratulate the CSO Forum for, for taking this forward. Um, just two concluding thoughts. So one is that there's currently a, a RCT for bridge underway in Kenya, um, and that relates to my final point, which is um, really emphasizing three words, and, and that is evidence, accountability, and assumptions. Um, so making sure that we have the evidence to increase accountability in order to question our assumptions. Uh, thank you. I mean, because we're sitting in World Bank, so it, it would be a good opportunity to talk to World Bank about its stand on private schools. So I, I remember yesterday in the CSO town hall, we heard from President Jim Kim talking about that World Bank is not afraid to move away from approaches which have been proven wrong. So in a way, it would be good to take into consideration all the evidence that's coming out of Kenya and Uganda, how the for-profit school is failing the system. And keeping in mind that World Bank invested 10 million in Bridge International in Kenya, 
and not much of resources to public education, it might be useful to review that approach and see how the actual uh, education system can be uh, improved. And the other thing, observation I would want to make from your presentation on is that, I mean, lumping all the schools into non-state actor might be inclusive, but it also loses the nuances that have between for-profit and non-profit education. So we need to be aware of that, and we need to make sure that that uh, difference and its implication for human rights obligations, which we have seen uh, Jim Kim commit in the World Education Forum last year as well, to be realized and implemented in its policies and uh, programs. And as you said, respecting the evidence that's coming out of the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just take the opportunity to respond to that since mm. it makes sense to do so. Um, so on, on the first point, I think our concluding remarks are actually complementary, not conflicting. Um, and the RCT of Bridge in Kenya um, is really designed and set up so that we understand more. Um, and I think that reinforces President Kim's remarks as well. Um, and on the second point, and perhaps I didn't articulate this well, but within our policy intent work and across all of our work, we define the non-state sector inclusively, but then within our policy intent reports, we benchmark according to the type of provider. Um, so we want to make sure that we get at the nuances across provider types, to your point. Thank you. I'm really grateful for all of you for to all of you for engaging in this important discussion. Clearly, this is the beginning, um, indeed, and I, I hope that as this new evidence comes to bear um, from the World Bank, from NGOs and civil society organizations, from governments, from local citizens, and, and families really grappling in real time with these important decisions, we ultimately together move forward for the highest quality, um, universal, free um, access to, to education for all of our children and youth. Thank you so much for joining us today.